Okay, um, welcome back to uh, the last talk of the afternoon. So we, we're going to have our own Urs Schreiber who's going to tell us about microscopic physics, uh, brain physics from Kohomotopy. Right, thanks very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to speak at a conference with the M-theory in the title. So there's a bunch of topics that Hisham has already announced that I might get to. Maybe I'll just get to the first two of them. I do want to start with some introduction, slowly get us uh, first motivated and then um, get a foot on the ground regarding what we're actually talking about. Um, the next slides of motivation might be a bit of a waste of your time and for an audience like this, but somehow in preparing this talk, I felt compelled to just say it in a moment. Um, regarding this point of microscopic and M-theory, I'd just like to highlight the following fact, which is completely well known, but sometimes not uh, emphasized a lot, so just for fun. Um, eventually, we're interested in studying some realistic quantum field theories like QCD, and in the non-perturbative confined regime, the, the perturbative quark model Lagrangian approach doesn't work. What does work, what's supposed to work, is to map this to a system of um, coincident brains under what's called ADS-QCD correspondence, so some adoption of the um, ADS-CFT correspondence. And then people like to say that, oh, if one just finds a gravity dual, one can say things about um, non-perturbative confining gauge field theories. That is all good and fine, but it, of course, rests on the uh, running assumption that was maybe implicit or explicit in what Mike Duff reminded us of this morning uh, regarding ADS-CFT having, having, having sort of diverted, what, what did you say, distracted the field a little. So in the end, of course, that large end limit that is necessary to actually speak of a gravity dual is not what we want for realistic theories. We want to uh, eventually keep, tr keep track of 1 over n corrections and work some finite small n, such as n equals 3. And that, of course, means that on the right-hand side, we don't have supergravity. We do have m theory. Small n means two things. It means where we have small wavelength, small scale limit, and the string is strongly coupled. So this is the m theory regime. And one reason, of course, why, why this evident fact isn't uh, more pronounced, maybe, in, in reviews and announcements is that we don't know what M theory actually is. That was also highlighted um, nicely in Mike Duff's talks, and that too is a triviality or tautology. But I made a little survey last year at the Strings 2019 conference in Brussels, checking with people, like non mathematically inclined string theorists, how they feel about the existence of M theory, and they were all fine with it. So the realization that there is some open problem here, for instance, if you want to talk about, say, D3 brain uplifts. Uh, you run into the problem that you don't, don't actually have a theory of microscopic brains, where microscopic means a small number, n of them. Coincident ones, but just three of them, say. So with, with enormous quantum effects there. So that was just a review for what we're, why we're here, I think, to talk about this open problem of formulating M theory in, an, in a precise fashion, in a mathematical fashion. And um, as everybody, I'll, to to motivate an approach to maybe at least proceed towards an answer of this problem, I'll look at the supergravity limit for a second, take the Toft coupling large in the previous motivation, and look at the large wavelength limit. So in that case, everything is clear. I'm just writing down ordinary standard Kremer, Julia Schurk supergravity here in a somewhat revisionist um, reformulation, just cleaning up some things in a way that I think is useful for then going further. So if this looks exotic, it's just me being fancy here. So if you want to speak some abstract language, you could say the covariant phase space of 11 dimensional supergravity, just plain old 11 dimensional supergravity. So covariant phase space means it's just the space of classical solutions equipped with its canonical uh, symplectic form, which I'm ignoring here, is some kind of uh, supermanifolds modeled on the d equals 11, n equals 1 super Minkowski space time. And maybe we want to allow orbifold effects, which play a role later on. So that's why I write G or B R 10 comma 1 slash 32 folds. Anyway, so that's just fancy terminology for the super manifold. And then the beauty of M theory compared to, say, the messy QCD that we might have started with or whatever other field theory we're trying to maybe dually model is, that it's so very clean conceptually. It just as these two fields, I mean, that's really one reason why we do want to go to M theory is because all the mass and complications in lower dimensions someone gets geom geometrized to just these two fields. One of them is kind of the zeroth field, the field of gravity, which I will not speak about much. The left column just shows some um, 
It's done nice stuff. So we want to focus on the other field, the one actual field in M theory, of course, the C field. And we've heard, and everybody knows, but it was reviewed in previous talks, that um, there's this one equation on it. The, I call it here the page equation because when page introduced the page charge, maybe he made the secret, but of course it's the Maxwell equation. Anyway, it's that equation that says that the cup square or the wedge square of the four form flux is actually trivialized by seven form, which if the equations of motion do hold, as we discussed in previous talks, happens to be the Hoch dual of G4, but a priori can write this equation independently of the equations of motion. So we discussed this after uh, Hisham's talk previously. The, the reason of writing it this way is to decouple possible cohomological meaning that maybe remains to be uncovered, remember Dirac in the 1930s, we come to this in a moment, from the equations of motion. So at the plane supergravity level, as you know, actually the, the Einstein equations on the left, the equations of motion and supergravity do imply this page equation. If you solve the supergravity equations of motion, um, well, part of it is that equation, but we still, as for uh, K theory in type 2b, we still want to say, well, let's look at what the cohomological meaning is of the flux forms before we impose equations of motion. And uh, what I'm going to make use of is now, so this is just the standard formula, and now we just equivalently reformulate it. So I'm not doing any hypothesizing in the next step, no speculation, nothing. I'm just proving or just quoting a theorem here. So on the left, there's a nice reformulation of the Einstein equations, which we can ignore for our purposes here. So on the right, this is what we saw in Hisham's talk, and we'll see maybe in some other talks, is that equation, dg7 plus 1 half g4, which the g4 equals 0, a very fancy name for that simple equation is simply that you say, well, together, that pair of flux forms is a co-cycle and a rationalized cohomotopy. It means it's classified by a map to the rational force sphere. I'll show this, I'll show this in more detail in a second. So the punchline is just, there is a cohomology theory, which happens to be called cohomotopy theory. It's, if you wish, the most fundamental of all cohomology theories as far as very general, generalized cohomology theories go. And if you just look at this differential equation, it's kind of the John character map, the John character image of the co-cycle in that cohomology theory. So just as K theory was partly discovered in string theory by saying, oh look, there are flux forms arranged into something that looks just like the Chan character from a cohomology theory called K-theory, we look at these forms and in exactly the same way, we made this very precise in, uh, in a sequence of articles, which maybe I'm setting somewhere or maybe I don't, um, on the, in these slides I mean, um, this equation is on the exact same footing as the Chan character formula for the R flux forms and so that should already made up, make us inclined to put on you know, the, the algebraic topologist's head and say, what is that actually in cohomology? So it's just a fact that these forms, this form equation just says that the flux forms of level dimensional supergravity are co-cycle in rationalized J-twisted cohomotopy. So J-twisted cohomotopy is some complicated, or I should say rich, it's actually a super, you know, it's not complicated as a definition, but it's super rich, but you can go to an approximation, which I mentioned this, where you forget all torsion in cohomology and homotopy groups. And in this approximation, um, it's these forms. So looking at this, in general, there are, in general, there are many generalized cohomology theories whose rationalization is a given rational cohomology theory. There are many of them. But in this case, one is singled out as being the smallest one just by number of cells in CW approximations, and that is actual cohomotopy. So looking at this, we can just say, well, maybe this is trying to tell us that the flux forms in M theory want to be a co-cycle in the generalized cohomology theory called cohomotopy or J-twisted cohomotopy, which I'll say in a moment more in detail what it is, such that passing to the rationalization, which is the same thing as computing the Chan character, gives us the flux forms, but there's much more information in a co-cycle in J-twisted cohomotopy. In particular, once we cross out the rationalization here, the two columns here are no longer, um, no longer imply each other in any way. The Einstein equations are just a statement or imply just a statement just about the rational image, but on the right-hand side, we're equipping that rational information now with a very rich um, algebraic topological structure. So that's just something one can give a name. I'm just giving it a name here, say, if we cross that out, right? So we use this equivalence, this is standard supergravity. We apply a theorem, we reformulate it equivalently, but then we say, oh, that suggests we can cross this out. You can call this charge quantized 
uh, supergravity with charge quantization cohomotopy. Well, so let's just say, let's just remove the large Torf coupling limit now and declare or hypothesize, because we don't know yet, we have to check this, hypothesize that this is actually the phase space of the M theory. So this is a hypothesis, we don't know if it's true. What we, what we want to make use of is it gives a precise mathematical um, structure to um, examine. So there's no string perturbation theory involved here. There's no arguments via holography involved here. There's no chanting, Witten, Susskind, this or that. We have this structure and we can just now crank out proving theorems what the implications are. And here's the flow chart of how we proceed. So crank out the implications of this hypothesis. If it looks like M theory, <laughs> so if we get convinced that this is M theory, well then keep, you know, start solving all the problems that need to be solved eventually. If not, well, there's a bit of a wiggle room here and how to make exactly this precise. So one has to specify, I think this was mentioned by, uh, after some talk, one has to specify exactly what one means by the differential refinement of this. There's some, um, some adjustments one may have to do if there are boundaries. So there's a little wiggle room in what exactly we want to mean. So we, we may allow ourselves to uh, play with this a bit, then try again. And that's the stage we're currently at. And I want to talk about today some of the implications that we do get from hypothesis age, which do look um, promising. So we, we cranked out a bunch of cases of this, which I'm trying to tabulate here. Um, so we, we kind of checked what does it mean if you assume that the space time is curved, so it's some topological manifold, but non singular, no orbifold singularities. Then it turns out the J twist in J twisted cohomotopy is what couples the flux to the topology of the manifold and gives rise to a whole list of half a dozen anomaly cancellation conditions that are famously thought to guarantee the consistency of would be M theory, part of which is the shifted C field flux quantization, which was mentioned before. Maybe this will be uh, said in more detail in Domenico's talk. There's the Seafield Tetpole constellation for M theory and eight manifolds. There's the, the level quantization of the M5 Hopf WZ term, which is what Dominic will mainly speak about, and some more. There's this integral equation of motion, which, um, who was it? Oh. Diaconescu, Moore, Witten, or somebody um, argued to be the derivation of K theory from M theory. It's that equation which, which somehow was argued to connect. Um, connect K theory to the 11 dimensional perspective, it does arise just as one component of the constraints you get by asking for lift to J twisted cohomotopy. So this is not what I'm going to talk about now, but I do recommend looking at our article, FSS 19b, twisted cohomotopy implies M theory anomaly cancellation. It derives all these things in a clean fashion. So one point maybe I should make here is that even though on the talk slides it can't and will not come across, you know, one, one of the aspects here is that at least we try to, you know, the, the point is once you have an actual definition, you can make rigorous derivations. So in these, these articles that I'm citing here, they all proceed by, proceed by definition theorem proof. They just prove the consequences of this hypothesis. There's no hand waving. There's no appeal, appeal to authority. There might, of course, be a mistake in a proof. If you find one, let us know. Then we check if we can salvage the theorem. But uh, so half of them have been accepted at least. FSS 19b has just been accepted by communications and mathematical physics. And um, I think we, we were careful. Then um, with Hisham, we looked at uh, doing this in the middle column here for flat space times. They do have, however, orbifold singularities. So they're not actually flat, but that's the kind of all the curvatures concentrated in the singular points. They're called flat orbifolds. And then it turns out, and I'll maybe, if I find time, briefly mention some aspects of this. Then um, asking your fluxes to lift to J-twisted cohomotopy implies the sort of the equivariant parts of the M-theory or the string theory anomaly cancellation conditions. One finds the R field tadpole cancellation orbifolds, and it's lift to M-theory via this cancellation, which is not as famous, but maybe more important, actually, of uh, M5 plane charges on MO5 planes. I'll have some graphics of this, maybe. And then what we did just recently, <coughs> just last month, we submitted this to the archive, is we looked at space times with horizons, and I'll say in a moment maybe, or maybe I won't get to it anyway, so we'll see um, what exactly that means. So that it has to do with in which directions of space time you demand charges in cohomotopy to vanish at infinity or not to vanish at infinity, which um, translates to asking um, 
what code I mentioned brains might be sitting in the space time whose charges are sort of concentrated around these brains and not flying away to infinity. And then it turns out that looking at the high observers on the Komotofi phase space in this situation reveals all the a whole lot of quantum structure that you expect on microscopic intersecting brains. Fuzzy funnel geometries, BLG3 algebras just come out. Uh, we see the BMN matrix model, the supersymmetric states, the M2, M5 bound states, and the, the hanani witten rules come out in a fun way. I'll show this maybe if I have time. So this is what I maybe try to, I don't know, no, I won't make any promises. So Hisham has uh, given a quick survey of all of this. Domenico will focus on this topological piece and I'll kind of aim for the second two columns. But before we get to all these applications, I want to say what exactly is cohomotopy? There's some graphics maybe. It's a super simple idea, but of course it's unfamiliar. As it goes sometimes, right, the, the simpler ideas are sometimes less familiar than the fancy mess that we've been brought up with. So here's just a cartoon of the state of the knowledge 100 years back when Dirac um, came up with what is now called Dirac charge quantization. So imagine a space-time on the left with a single magnetic monopole, which we might maybe take out of the space-time, indicated by this little sphere on the left. Then Dirac argued, as you know, that quantum mechanics, quantum mechanically electrically charged particles running around in the space-time subject to the force of this monopole, like the electron, then consistency of quantum mechanics implies that the charge of this magnetic charge has to be quantized in, in, in integer levels in terms of the given electron charge. And um, eventually this was mathematically formalized as saying that, as you know, that the two-form flux that is on the space and the Faraday tensor has to be just the rational approximation of a co-cycle in a cohomology theory. In this case, it was ordinary cohomology in degree two. And an ordinary cohomology in degree two has a classifying space, as Hisham reminded us of, which uh, is usually called KZ2, just to confuse us all, I, I call it BU1, or it's also CP infinity as a homotopy type. But it's just some space so that homotopy class of maps into it classify ordinary integral cohomology, whose rational image then, whose the RAM image, uh, should be the Faraday tensor. And the picture on the left is just supposed to remind you or else tell you that, um, slightly not, not worthy for, for what follows, CP infinity, of course, is the space you get by starting with a two-sphere and then attaching higher cells to it. And actually for Dirac's charge quantization argument, just the bare argument that you do have integral charge, you could just as well stick to this two-sphere cell because we're mapping out of a space in the original Dirac argument that's just somewhat to be equivalent to a two-sphere. So with that argument, all that matters really about Dirac charge quantization is that the mappings of the two-sphere around itself are classified by the integers and that's the charge quantization. So underlying the direct charge quantization argument is really a co-cycling cohomotopy where we say, which is then kind of sent further to an ordinary integral cohomology co-cycle, which, which says that <coughs> the charge on the left here on that space-time is something that is classified by a homotopy class of a map to this classifying space, which happens to be a two-sphere with further cells, further cells attached to it. So that's the state of the art in 1930. And just as a side remark here, um, it turned out that when was it proved in the 1960s, that if you classify monopole charge of young Mills monopoles, shown again on the left as these little spheres taken out of the space-time, it is actually classified by, um, by rational cohomotopy in the sense of um, in the sense of now of complex geometry, uh, rational maps to the Riemann sphere. So the concept of cohomotopy, even though it's not uh, traditionally emphasized so much, is actually present in the work of Atiyah Hitchin from the 1960s. Just as a side remark, so we, what we're asking now is what, in that sense, right, we've seen magnetic monopoles, we've seen Young-Mills monopoles, we know that five brains, if you wrap them suitably, represent monopoles, you know, if you take an M theory with five brains, take a suitable KK compactification, you can model monopoles as wrapped five brains. So somehow there should be a charge assigned with five brains, which reduces to these previous cases, but which is somehow richer because it's there already in 11D before you KK compactify. So we're just asking which space is there on, should there be on the right here, which is the classifying space for fluxes in M theory, so that a given charge configuration in M theory is a homotopy class of maps from here to there. 
or eventually it will be you know Hamoctu class and some cohesive infinity topos to get the to get the differential cohomology. But for the moment we're just talking about the kind of the the charges as such. So that's what we're asking and Hypothesis H says it's the four sphere. So every cohomology theory has a classifying space. Ordinary cohomology has these einberg maclean spaces, CP infinity for ordinary cohomology in degree two. K theory has the, you know, the classifying space of the uh, stable unitary group as its classifying space so that you know, K theory classes, hence R charges, are classified by homotopy class of maps into BU times Z maybe. And we're just saying, okay, let's, we need some other classifying space, and we take actually the simplest non-trivial space that algebraic topology has to offer, and that is the, the cell, as they say, in degree four, which is just the four sphere. So this is the topological four sphere, just the homotopy type of the four sphere. We don't, at this point, later on, we will do stuff, but at this point, it's just the sphere as a homotopy type. So plane cohomotopy is just that. It's just homotopy class of maps, as shown on the left here, from our space-time to the four sphere. So homotopy just means you, you continuously deform that map. And if, if they're continuously deformable, we identify them, they will have the same charge. So the only thing we add to this, and this is where this Hopf vibration comes in, we ask for arguments that come actually from analysis of the super p-brain WZ terms, one sees this was implicit in stuff we've seen before, but maybe I, I can't really refer to it now, the straight face. <coughs> but, um, but it follows from this that the rational cohomology theory we're really seeing, if you do disentangle the G4 flux from the G7 flux, is really um, not just classified by the four sphere rationally, but by the quaternion Hopf vibration that maps from the seventh sphere to the four sphere. So the theory knows the full flux, G4 and G7, is classified by a map to the four sphere. And disentangling from this just the page charge of the five brain, that means lifting through the quaternion Hopf vibration. And now, a curious thing we figured out in this article, FSS 19b, is that the equivalence group of the quaternion Hopf vibration is precisely this uh, central product of sp2 with sp1. So this is su Two, uh, so spin three with spin five, <coughs> Cartesian product and with the central Zemo two quotient. Excuse me. <coughs> so, um, so this J twisting means that on the four sphere, there's this canonical action of sp three of, of spin three times spin five. Spin five acts in the canonical way, and sp thanks. And spin three actually acts trivially on the four sphere, but the full Speed five times spin three actually acts non-trivially on the seventh sphere upstairs. That's important. And so, so in homotopy theoretic terms, that means we can take the homotopy quotient, this kind of the universal spherical vibration over the classifying space of this group. And if we want to twist, that means, so this is now the first condition actually that we derive from requiring J-twisting of cohomotopy. The first condition is that the tangent bundle, so J-twisting just means we twist with the class of the tangent bundle by the J-homomorphism, it's just fancy uh, terminology. So it, the first condition we see is that the tangent bundle has actually have to, has to have a spin three times spin five structure. And you'll notice that spin three times spin five structure is actually exactly the normal structure of a five brain, which includes a two brain of, so of M5, M2 bound states. So things are actually falling into place. And working this out gives just, just the requirement that you have M theorem and eight manifold with this structure already gives the uh, DMW an anomaly cancellation just from you know, looking up actually results on these structure groups, there's already the first implications that one finds that have otherwise been postulated. So that's what twisted, J-twisted cohomotopy of a space-time X means. It's the set, it's not in general a group as you're used to, it can be a group, well in this case, it's anyway, it's the set of classes of maps from space-time to the homotopy quotient of the four sphere by that group, which makes this triangle homotopy commutative. So in, in worse, this means um, given your tangent bundle, you can associate actually a spherical vibration over space-time, and a co-cycle and twisted cohomotopy is a section on a patch of space-time. It's a homotopy class of a map from that patch to the plane four sphere, and, and globalized such that there's some twisting going on as the space-time may be topologically non-trivial. So that's the definition. 
So now let's, let's try to get some, some ideas. This was already mentioned by my time in earlier talks. This is the most basic example, but it turns out the excellent version of this is actually already super rich and contains actual brain information. What I'm showing now is just the classical point and tome theorem from the what, 1940s. Super classical. It's usually written in a fancy form with uh, you know, the collapse map and there's tome spaces involved and uh, kind of it obfuscates a bit the very simple um, physical picture behind the Pontryagin and tome corpus, which this slide is supposed to highlight. So it's just a classical construction, just drawn in a, in a suggestive way. Pontryagin and tome in one direction says, if you have a space time x with a submanifold here, that happens to be equipped with a normal framing, so with the trivialization of its normal bundle. Which really just means in words, trivialization of a normal bundle means there's an unambiguous notion, as long as you're close enough to the brain, of what the normal distance is. You can unambiguously say what is the normal distance to this brain. And we you use your normal framing and run along the vectors of the, the such trivialized um, normal bundle. But so we can say, well, let's say after some distance, we're infinitely far away, asymptotically far away. Say we've climbed enough out of the throat of our brain to not further bother anymore with its gravitational effect. That's the way you should think of it physically. So we declare that everything that is beyond the last dashed line here is for all practical purposes infinitely far away from the brain. And then we get a co-cycle in cohomotopy just by assigning the asymptotic distance function. We simply send every point in space-time that is equipped with a submanifold, which of course is our brain, we just send it to the normal distance. And you see if the space-time is an, um, an n-manifold, then that normal distance, directed normal distance now, is a, is a vector in Rn. But we're saying, well, once we are, so we actually can move to infinity. So we add the point at infinity. This is supposed to be a cartoon of Rn, one point compactified to infinity, right? If you remove the point at infinity by stereographic projection, this is just Rn, and we're just assigning all finite uh, asymptotic distances. I add this point at infinity to know where all these other points go, and together this gives me a map to the sphere. And that is a core cycle that is what we will call the charge carried by this brain, the cohomotopy charge carried by this brain. It's a canonical, so you know, part of the theorem says now uh, that the homotopy class of this map and hence the cohomotopy uh, class that we've constructed here is independent of these choices, like how exactly you chose the tubular neighborhood and some things are swept under the rug here. So this gives a well-defined charge. That's the cohomotopy charge. And the Poincaré and Tom theorem actually says that, that, and that's important maybe for what we want to do, the Poincaré and Tom theorem says this construction is an isomorphism between normally framed submanifolds of the corresponding co-dimension and, um, um, and cohomotopy classes. So what does it mean in terms of our, our physics picture? It means if we measure brain charge in cohomotopy, we can completely, from just the charge, we can reconstruct the brain. See, we're not, we're, we're not going to encode actual submanifolds by hand. We're encoding by hand the charge structure, which is in cohomotopy, but the point of the theorem says, at least in the simple non-equivalent blah, blah, blah configuration, that from just this charge structure, you can actually reconstruct the brains, well, up to cobordism, I should say. Yeah, I'll show this in yeah. the next Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I wanted, I'm trying to understand the difference between this and the usual cohomology picture. So is there a brain configuration that will be allowed by yours, your hypothesis, but not by the usual uh, cohomology or vice versa? Yes, so this is, this is part, of, part of what we're doing. This is actually part of what, what Hisham mentioned in his talk. So there's a comparison map called the Boardman folk tomomorphism. You'll see this in a moment. That goes from cohomotopy to ordinary cohomology. And that map has both a kernel and a co-kernel. So, so there is a map from, from Sn to Kzn. So, so the case of interest is from the four sphere degree four cohomotopy to the ordinary integral four cohomology. Hisham had this on his slides. And pushing forward along this says that if you have a manifold x, then its degree four cohomotopy set, you know, ignoring twists now, assuming that maybe the tangent bundle is trivial, maps forward to ordinary cohomology. And this map is, in general, far from being an isomorphism. It can happen in some degenerate cases. It has two properties. It doesn't need to hit every co-cycle, and it doesn't need to remember every co-cycle. So it has a kernel, which is kind of M theory. If you, if you, if you assume hypothesis M, uh, sorry, hypothesis H, and say this is the actual charge, then the kernel is stuff that gets lost when you do kind of the ordinary string theoretic approximation. 
where it also has a co-image, a co-kernel, which is the stuff that is not hit. So this is stuff that is in the swarm plant, if you want. This is stuff that will, these are apparent configurations, charge configurations, which on a hypothesis H will actually be ruled out because they will not be in the image. So are there explicit examples of X that one can construct where this happens? So, so I think we, in discussion, we had the, the easy case where if X happens to have the same dimension, if X, if X happens to be a four manifold, then this is an isomorphism given by the, if, if X is a four manifold. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show slides with, with examples of this in just a moment, okay? Okay. Is this a maximal in some sense? I'm, I'm, I have a dumb question I'm going to blame on jet lag. There is lore that... Um, Use your mic microphone. Uh, I'm just not there. Um, so there's old lore, which I'm not going to state correctly right now because I'm, I'm just too tired, that uh, uh, in any uh, consistent, that uh, in any theory of, gra a theory of gravity with a UV completion ought to have a, a maximal charge lattice, that there shouldn't be any allowed electromagnetic states that don't appear in the lattice. Um, is it, and, uh, my question is vague. Is there some sense in which uh, cohomotopy gives a maximal lattice? You said it... Uh, contains stuff that not in cohomology. Is it the largest thing? Does it contain the most stuff not in cohomology relevant to or as versus uh, any other generalized cohomology theory one might write down? So what one can say is if, if we do stabilize, if we go to stable cohomotopy written as four with a four sphere spectrum, then this is the the initial cohomology th multiplicative cohomology theory among all multiplicative cohomology theories, which means that it's, in this sense, the smallest and that it's, it's the limiting cohomology theory. For the unstable case, there must be some analogous statement, but I'm not sure. I, I should give a better answer, though, to Ashoka's question. So the, Hisham, Hisham talked about, uh, about the lift here. So, so all these conditions, all these anomaly cancellation conditions that we find in the general case, they're all conditions that you have to satisfy in order to lift a class from here to here. So for instance, one condition was if you want to lift here, then you need that SQ2 of your, of your co-cycle is zero, which, which implies in particular that SQ3 of C is zero, which is, the, which is what used to be called the proof of K theory from, from M theory, because that's, that's the equation you also see in the idea Hillsborough spectral sequence for lifting to twisted K theory. So the whole sequence of anomaly cancellation conditions in M theory, as far as we proved that they do follow from here, are conditions that say, um, that have, are satisfied here, but not necessarily for ordinary cohomology. It's a bit, it's a bit like an M theoretic swamp plant uh, story. You say, if you take your ordinary C field flux to be an ordinary integral cohomology, then you might actually find yourself in a configuration that doesn't lift to actual M theory under hypothesis H. It's sort of in the swamp M, the M swamp or something. And these conditions lifting through here are those that lift it. Yeah, I think I'll, we'll see more examples of this coming up. But yeah, okay, there's lots of stuff to be talked about. So I was, I was in the middle in the middle of giving some illustration of what a co-cycle and cohomotopy actually looks like. So we've maybe got an idea how it's related to submanifolds by interpreting um, the cohomotopy co-cycle map as being the asymptotic distance map from the brain. And this slide is supposed to illustrate that in this story, actually, brain interbrain charges are encoded too, because, um, because part of the statement of the Pondergan Tom theorem is that um, uh, that uh, right, the, the, winding, the winding around the sphere uh, sort of has two directions. It can wind one way or the opposite way. And this is encoded in, in how, so, okay, so I should say, so here we were looking at the sphere kind of from the outside. Here I'm showing for, for illustration purposes, the sphere kind of by looking at the plane that it is and then taking this, this boundary to infinity. So you should think of these little blobs as being close to the to a sphere as you go into the board. 
And so what on the right, on the left, what we're seeing is a manifold with some points, and which are submanifolds, zero-dimensional submanifolds in this picture now. And so we're assigning this map, uh, this this um, uh, this uh, asymptotic normal distance map. And there's a choice in assigning the asymptotic distance whether by identifying the tubular neighborhood of the point with that sphere, you can do it either in an orientation preserving or orientation reversing way. Now, if you do the orientation reversing way, this uh, will give two canceling wrapping contributions in the force field, so this will cancel out. So it means that, you know, if I indicate these by black dots, with orientation preserving, and these by white dots, with kind of an anti-brain, you know, a missing brain, then um, an equal number of them will cancel out. This is kind of encoded in cohomotopy. And more explicitly, you can see the, the canceling, maybe this is overkill now, by cobordism. So, so this just illustrates that the canceling of a point, so this is now our space time here, the canceling of this brain against this brain in cohomotopy is explicitly exhibited actually by a cobordism. Uh, anyway, this is not so important for what I'm going to say. So this will be important for getting our, hand, our hands on actual examples is, so I, I, drew, I drew these cartoons of manifolds that seem to stretch out forever. So in the cartoon, they look a bit like RNs. Of course, the cohomology of RN and also the cohomotopy is trivial because it's contractible and every cohomology theory is homot plain cohomology theory is homotopy invariant. To get um, interesting stuff, it, this is about bringing in these horizons. We have to say, Charges have to vanish at infinity. This is the usual instanton story, just phrased in algebraic topologist terms. So we say, um, let's assume we're on a space-time where any charge, C field charge or whatever, uh, is required to vanish at infinity, the usual condition for having finite energy solutions and so forth. And the way to exomatize this mathemat mathematically is to pass to the one-point compactification, which we've already seen on the sphere coefficient, now also for the space-time coefficient. So we add a point that we call the, sp the point at infinity and put a topology on the resulting larger set with that point included that encodes the fact that as you move to infinity in the original Euclidean space, you eventually sort of reach the actual point at infinity. Phrased this way, um, now um, a co-cycle vanishing at infinity in any cohomology theory, shown here for cohomotopy theory, but that works for any cohomology theory, is just represented by any map that happens to take that point at infinity to whatever point counts as zero charge on the right. So it's a pointed map, a map of pointed topological spaces, taking infinity to infinity. Well, infinity here, remember, is really, this is an ambiguity one can't get around in this notation, this is really zero charge, right? Because this means infinitely far away from a brain, we don't see any effects anymore. So we see that uh, classifying, well, you, you're familiar with this maybe from basic discussion maybe of KO theory of toroidal or antifolds and stuff. People use this all the time. Anyway, it means that if we classify cohomotopy charge vanishing at infinity of Euclidean spaces or Minkowski spacetimes, then we're actually computing homotopy groups of spheres. Because, right, this makes the spacetime a sphere. The coefficient is now a sphere. And so we see, which was mentioned by Hisham, that cohomotopy, of course, duly is related to homotopy groups. And so this signifies that beyond the, the rational information that remains rationally, there's now an infinite, extremely rich tower of non-rational torsion information, which is notoriously rich in that it's not actually fully uncovered. It will maybe never be. OK, so that, that was the general idea of cohomotopy. I, sh I should check how I'm doing with time. But maybe I'll just keep going until you leave the room. <laughs> well, let me just. Okay, so, so that, was the, that was the ordinary Pontryagin and Tome theorem from the 1940s, just written in, in fancy diagrams. And uh, as you can see from this picture here, there's not too much one can say if these are now in the same degree, in the same dimension, say a four manifold, four manifold here, well then the commodity class are measured by the integers and just corresponds to the net number of points. So you see here some points with positive charge, some negative charge, so we would just say, okay, there's minus, uh, sorry, there's uh, what in total, uh, charge two here. There's not much more to be said. Uh, I just want to maybe highlight regarding the word microscopic in the title that we're beginning, and this will be amplified in what follows as we put it in the equivariance, we're beginning to see the microscopic structure, right? In ordinary cohomology, you could also measure total charge two, so you would know my space-time contains n equals two brains. And that's all you can say by just looking at ordinary cohomology. What's beginning to be interesting here is that via the Pontryagin-Tome theorem, these brains actually appear 
as actual points. You can kind of put a big microscope now on your space time and say, ha, I see a brain, there's one, and actually there's an, an anti-brain which cancels this. So you see substructure um, that is not otherwise seen. Even though here, unless we put more structure in it, like every variance or differential structure, it will in homotopy class, of course, go away. But this is actually the source of the microscopic information that we see. Okay, let's go to orientifold. So let's check what, the, what happens now if maybe our Euclidean spaces have orbifold singularities. This slide is just to show my notation for orbifolds, but maybe it's obvious, so I'll just keep going. So this is the, sort of the previous picture, but now we're assuming our Euclidean space is an orientifold. It's equipped with the ZMOD2 action. We're going to look at more interesting actions in a moment. For the moment, just a reflection action, say, as in Java witten theory, which reflects the Euclidean space um, at its origin, which means that after um, passing to its one-point compatification, we get what Algebraic topologists call the representation sphere of that action. We get a sphere which is equipped with this um, reflection sort of at the, at the equator, at least in the simple picture. And um, to measure that charge, we uh, put also an according equivariance structure on our coefficient sphere. So this is actually related to this J-twisting. If you remember, J-twisting said that we're not, just, we're not just mapping plainly to the sphere, we're actually mapping to the spherical vibration, um, or taking a section of the spherical vibrations over space-time, which is associated with the tangent bundle. If you do it for an orbifold that is a simple quotient orbifold as this, then it just has the trivial sphere sitting everywhere and uh, has that representation sphere sitting at the origin. So this situation that we're now changing our sphere coefficient to also be equipped with um, equivariant action is actually um, a reflection of that J-twisting. And so that means our homotopy, homotopy classes are now equivariant homotopy classes. So they are homotopy class of maps as before, but everything has to respect the group actions on both sides. And if we just take n equals 1 here, it's an instructive exercise to just check what that actually means under the previous point and tome theorem. So you can check, easily check, that the map from a circle to a circle that winds n times at constant speed is Z mod 2 equivariant. So then there are two cases. Either it winds an even number of times or it winds an odd number of times. If you go through it, you see the, the maps that wind an even number of times, they will not, not you, you see the pre-image of this zero, this is always where the brain sit, right? This is zero distance from the brain. If you wind an even number of times, you find this, no, that you find that the fixed point here, so this is the orientifold fixed point here, will not be in the pre-image of zero. So you just get a bunch of brains appearing in pairs, in their or orbifold pairs, as expected. But if you do have an odd number of windings, well, then there's one brain that is fixed here, that is stuck there at the orientifold point. So equivariance in cohomotopy, one of the Portrait and Home theorem, gives us this folklore statement that if you do have an orbifold singularity, then there are kind of two things that can go on. There can be brains that are stuck at the singularity, and there's brains floating around. And not only that, it tells us also about the total charges. The guy that is stuck here appears as a single point, which under orbifolding, or antifolding really means it's half a point, right? So these, are, these look like two points, but they're actually the two orbifold images of each other. So the observer in such a space-time as we actually quotient will see a single brain here, and it's a guy here with half that charge. So this is actually the sense, I'll, I'll get to this in more detail, but this is the sense actually of the cohomotopy solution to, um, to the M5, MO5 anomaly cancellation, where some indirect arguments about world volume uh, anomalies on the brains led to the proposal that these MO5 planes should carry half M5 brain charge. It comes down to this statement here. So there's this theorem in Tom Dick's book, which is very well hidden, but a very beautiful theorem, the equivalent Hopf degree theorem, which gives an answer to this general question. If you have some Euclidean space with a group action on it, and you're measuring its cohomotopy charge in J-twisted cohomotopy theory, so with the same representation sphere, then it tells you in general the situation looks like so. Either there is or there is not a brain stuck at the orbifold singularity, and the other brains appear in regular representations, or here in, in regular G sets around it. Let's see, I think I have a slide for this. Yeah, so the next slide shows this for the Z mod 4 group, so this, this equivalent Hopf degree theorem. Um, applies to any finite, in fact, compact Lie groups. So suppose on the left I'm showing now a cartoon of a Z mod 4 
or be fold. So it's just Euclidean space with Z mod 4 rotation action. So that means all brains appear in, a, in Z mod 4 tuples here in orbits, except one that may actually be stuck to the singularity. So by the equivalent Hopf degree theorem, we know that a general co-cycle in equivalent chromotopy of that or before, so a bunch of notation here, maybe just ignore the notation, that's just what it's saying. It's the J-twisted equivalent chromotopy of that global quotient, or before the shard is vanishing at infinity, uh, is given in this form. And there's a strengthening of this theorem, kind of a part two of the theorem, which explicitly compares this now under passage to K-theory, or K-O-theory. So for that, we, we realize that we have two maps. So this unstable, as it were, sort of non-abelian cohomology theory, which is chromotopy, can be stabilized. This was what I indicated here by sending the, the naive sphere, no, the actual sphere, to the four-shifted sphere spectrum. That makes it a stable cohomology theory, which is what most people mean when they say generalized cohomology theory, like K-theory. And this lands us here in what's called the g equivalent stable cohomology. Then there's a further map, Boltzmann homomorphism, that was already mentioned before, which kind of witnesses the fact that stable cohomology is the initial multiplic multiplicative cohomology theory. Every other multiplicative cohomology theory, like K-theory, ordinary cohomology, complex covidism, whatnot, has an essentially unique, so homotopy unique, multiplicative map of this sort, a comparison map. And what I'm showing here, so this is named after Boltzmann, the Boltzmann homomorphism now goes from, um, if, if we, if we say, let's compare to K-theory, right? The idea is now that we say, okay, we have our hypothesis, our M-brain charges, like for the M or B-folds, are actually here on the left. So what now? We want to check, you know, we don't much just want to go home and say, oh, we figured it out. We want to check this against stuff that people talk about. So people talk about charges in KO theory on these oriented folds. So let's just look at the canonical comparison map to KO theory and see what we see. In part two of the Tom Deeg's equivalent Hopf degree theorem, has the following um, beautiful explanation. It says, well, if you do have a brain configuration here in equivalent chromotopy, which is given by these G sets, as it were, in general, they can be more complicated. For these ADE groups, it's always just the, the singleton here or the regular one, but, or a multiple of the regular one. You first send them, well, you first extract them here as you go to the stable chromotopy to, to virtual actual G sets. I mean, sorry. Virtual G. So it turns out there's a famous theorem that identifies the G-equivalent chromotopy sort of in degree, total degree zero, so this J-twisted case, with um, kind of the K-theory, the non-linear K-theory, K-theory of G-sets. So it's just formal linear combinations of finite sets equivalent G-actions. So we extract our brains here and ask, well, how does the orbifold group act on them? Well, it acts trivially on the guy that's stuck at the center, and it acts by regular orbiting through on the others. And then, finally, the second part of the theorem says, under the Boltzmann homomorphism to KO theory, this just goes to the linear representations that is spanned by this G set. So if you have a G set, a set with G action, you can you induce a linear representation of G by taking the set to be the basis vectors and extending linearly. And so in this case, we find that um, this configuration of brain charges here in chromotopy maps to the KO class G equivalent KO class of the point identified with the representation ring, which is yeah, one copy of the trivial wrap here for the guy stuck in the middle, and then any number of copies of the regular wrap. And I should have included the, the slide where I collected from the, from the literature all computations where people compute um, RR field tadpole cancellation for ADE singularities. And even though nobody ever admits that they follow this general pattern, if you just run through all the um, separate computations by various authors, you find that on ADE orbifolds, which I'm focusing on here, um, the local RF, R tadpole constellation is always of this form. Locally, uh, it just says that you have the guys sitting in the trivial wrap at the center and any number of regular wraps floating around. And then globally, there's one more condition. So we see that, so this is, this is like the simplified version of the proof that equivalent chromotopy implies local R field tadpole cancellation. We can generalize this. So this was for single Euclidean G orbifolds, which is. Okay. Can I ask one question? Yes, please. Yeah, so if we take uh, a normal type one theory, then the KO theory predicts the existence of a D zero brain and a D eight brain. But we know that in string theory, D eight brain doesn't exist because it has a tachyon. 
So will can this uh, homotopy classification uh, tell us that that's thought will, should happen that a D8 brain shouldn't exist? Um, well, yeah. So I I don't have a full answer to this, but but um, but part of the point is that we actually do want to maybe want to see how the D8 brain actually does exist after all in in a suitable formulation of M theory, right? So in type one, it doesn't it, it it's unstable, so it uh, it decays. Yeah. Even though Keogh theory predicts that it exists. Um, right. So okay. So so um, so we're back to we're back. Right. Thanks. Yeah. So we're back to this question. See, we have the Borpin homomorphism. So we have now this map from uh, the kind of hypothesized cohomology theory to the Ko theory. And again, it has a kernel and a co-kernel. So there may be classes here that are not in the image. And there will be classes here that uh, get identified as we move through. So, um, yeah, so it may be interesting to see if that, yeah, that's what should, happens, if one can rule out the D8 brain by this. Yeah, so we haven't, we haven't checked, we haven't checked the apron charges in this picture. What, what we did check is we checked, yeah, this for the, for the G-equivariant case, we, we proved that, so here's a statement, which we proved just by, by computer computation, actually. Uh, we proved that the image of this map here consists precisely, so, so this K-theory of the point, G-equivariant K-theory of the point is equivalent to the, to the character ring, and the image of the equivariant cohomotopy for ADE subgroups for, for ADE subgroups of FC2, final subgroups of FC2, consists precisely of those characters that are non-irrational, right? So you, you take your GREP, you write the group character, the trace of um, all the conjugacy classes of group elements, and in general it can happen that that trace is an irrational number. And the theorem says that these cases are ruled out by Hypothesis H. <laughs> now we should yes. check what this means for the D8 print. Actually, that, yeah, I don't know. That would be interesting, yeah. Okay. So in that case, we, what we refer to this, there was some old work from, from the 90s by Bacher, Schweiger, who's maybe not here yet, and some others who ran into the issue of irrational D-brain charge. And there was a bit of a commotion back then in the 80s or the 90s because people said, oh, this, this doesn't look right. What, what's going on? Why do we see irrational charges? And we thought... Um, that was a good sign that the cohomotopy exactly removes those, you know, sends them kind of to the M swarm plant. But yeah, I don't know, maybe we should check with the, the eight brain. Yeah, maybe we can talk about it. Right, so what I'm showing here is just, just a generalization of, of what we had in the previous slides from kind of single singularities. This is like the vicinity, you know, this one point compactification here gives us the picture of the vicinity of a singularity. And now we can go to toroidal oriented folds where we have various singularities, but maybe I'll just switch over this, uh, skip over this. And then, you know, there's some further stuff one can invoke to get eventually the global tadpole cancellation. So global tadpole cancellation has, turns out to have just this nice formulation in the end by, by arguing via differential refinement that you say, well, locally, I mean, you ha need to have this co-cycling equivalent cohomotopy, and you ask that the underlying co-cycling plane cohomotopy vanishes, which just means, see, these, these brains were, were kind of stuck, either stuck to the singularities or forced to float around the vicinity by equivariance. So you remove equivariance, um, homotopies of the, your classifying maps may not move these brains freely around, and global tadpole cancellation just means that then they annihilate. So there's some further detail to, to actually apply this to the M5 brains, which I'm skipping here. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm pretty much out of time, actually, but since I have a D8 brain here on the slide, maybe I should say a word about this. Do I have five minutes left? Let me try. Okay. So, so that was, um, just to recall, so what I, what I tried to do is, I, I tried to recall a bit what, what you know, Pontry and Tom theorem was just microscopic brain charge, and then equivalent Hopf degree theorem kind of gave us this idea of orientable tadpole cancellation. Now I'm doing another variant of stuff. I'm saying, what we're doing now is we're saying, since we're in, in, in a homotopy theory, we should now think more carefully about what actually is an observable in our theory. We should really think homotopy theoretically. This is one of these issues with fine print of what you actually mean by hypothesis age that one needs to think about. If we say that the phase space of M theory is 11 dimensional supergravity backgrounds equipped with twisted cohomotopy co cycles, we have to ask, well, do we mean the set of twisted cohomotopy, which you can mean, but it's a funny thing to do now once you're in the somotopy setup, you have the full co-cycled space of the cohomology classes 
the gauge transformations, so homotopies between them, the gauge of gauge transformations, homotopies, homotopies. So, so what we do now is we say, well, clearly it's gotta be, it's gotta be that full higher structure, as people say these days, homotopy theoretic structure. So I write a bold phase pi, this is a bold phase, pi four. Now, not just for the homotopy class of maps from our space time to S4, I'm ignoring the twist now just to not get overwhelmed with uh, too many details. So now we're assuming maybe exosome torus or something. Or just Euclidean space, one point compactified. <coughs> so we're just mapping to S4, but we're considering not just the homotopy class of maps, but the full mapping space. So you consider the topological space of all maps topologized in the way, in the usual way, compact open topology, which means and we can now continuously deform these maps, but do we, we do remember how we deform it. So these deformations are now gauge transformations between our core cycles, and then there may be um, deformations of deformations and so forth, right? So what I'm saying here is that the ordinary connected components, pi zero of the core cycle space, that's the ordinary commodity set that we discussed so far, but now we also have access to pi one, pi two, and so forth. So bold phase pi is now the cohomotopy co-cycle space. The higher, if you translate this, if you go rational again, then this translates to having ghosts of ghosts in your chevalier eilenberg algebra, in your, B, in, a, in your BRST complex. So these would, be, these would correspond to ghosts. This is kind of the, the global structure behind these ghosts. So here's a theorem from, what, 1950s? May Siegel. Um, which characterize this cohomotopy co cycle space for certain situations. And it turns out these are actually, seems very restrictive at the beginning, but these are actually interesting. <coughs> so that, that's just math again. So suppose we're on R3. And uh, you see um, on R3, the cohomotopy, the four, the cohomotopy set in degree four is trivial because the only map, you know, all maps from S3 to S4 are contractible to the point. So if you do quotient out homotopy, and you see no information on R3. But since we're forming now the co-cycle space, we see that essentially unique co-cycle, but also then it's gauge it's space of gauge transformations, the space of gauge of gauge transformations. And that space, the cohomotopy co-cycle space in degree four on R3, vanishing at infinity, that's what this compactification means, was characterized by May. Siegel actually just restated this and generalized it, so it's really May's theorem, but people know it as Siegel's theorem, so I call it May's Siegel theorem. They say that this commodity because I can space is actually equivalent, homotopy equivalent to the, the manifold, which is the, the configuration space of, yeah, and now there's some details. So these, in total, these are points in R4. So this is a cartoon of R4. There's an R3 going vertically, and there's a, an R1 going horizontally. And the, the way it's split up is supposed to signify that we have stuff vanishing at infinity only in some of these directions. So as points move in R3, they can never vanish. They can move up to the sky, but we can always pull them back. Whereas if they uh, go to infinity along R1, then it's, you know, then they actually, vanish. they can actually escape. So this space is the space where points, configuration they may escape along R1. And moreover, they're required to be distinct just as points in R3. So that's what these lines are supposed to indicate. So this is a point in R4, right? R3 times R1. And this is the projection to R3. And so these projections here, that's why I gave them these little fuzzy funnels here, as it were, for good reason. They have to be distinct, so they, they don't coincide here. That's, so, and that is the, the space, so this is what, yeah, this is what some people call like, Siegel would call this the space of configurations of points in R3 with labels in S1, he might actually say, which is the D1 with its boundary identified. So that's the space. So you see a shadow, this is like a, this is now a spacey version, a higher version of our point track and tome theorem from before, which also said that maps uh, to cohomotopy classified submanifolds. But now we see the space of these submanifolds. So what, I, what, we, what we're showing here is just one configuration, kind of a zero dimensional submanifold. But now in this space, we can move around and in doing so these points now move, but without, without coinciding in this direction. So that's just a theorem. And, um, I'm going to apply this um, to this situation where I'm, I'm doing kind of, so this is, I should say, this is really a sequence of theorems. Analogous theorems hold for all co dimensions here. So also pi four of R1 is configurations in, in R1 comma R3, kind of the, the opposite situation. If we combine that, 
So I'm trying to draw this here. So this is where these, these horizons come in. So suppose we, we look at the space time, um, which is, yeah, I should have just specified to four here. So, so this is a, let's, let's go like, so this is an R4 where we say charge, there's something, there's something in this space time whose charge has to vanish in this direction. So there's some kind of brains maybe stretching here so that the charges are confined. Whereas this is the opposite way. And then, um, and then the May-Siegel theorem, sorry, I'm running a bit out of steam, it seems. So the May-Siegel theorem tells us because, you know, this configuration space is an actual manifold, whereas this was just an abstractly defined homotopy type of a space. So we can now go ahead and say, well, on such space times that look like this, we declare a differential, so a geometric version of cohomotopy. So that's the choice we're making now in refining hypothesis H. We uh, declare that it actually assigns that smooth manifold, that configuration space. So this is a differential refinement in the sense that if you forget the smooth structure here, if you just remember the topological structure, May Siegel says, tell us that this is actually a model for the cohomotopy space. So on, on space times that look like so, not on general space times, there is a canonical smooth manifold, which is like the smooth moduli space version of our original classifying space. It's that configuration space. And uh, here's a little lemma one can come up with. So it says that if we combine these situations, if we ask for um, configurations um, right, that, that may vanish to infinity in this direction and have to be distinct in this direction, uh, we combine that with configuration for which is the other way around, then it turns out that fiber product of configuration spaces is, um, so, so in these spaces, the points were, were not equipped with an ordering. They were just submanifolds. It turns out um, in this total space, it, it, we have an ordering. This is why I put one to any. So this is the ordered configuration space. So I'm showing this maybe in the next slide. Yeah, here. So, so this, uh, this little lemma says that if we form this fiber product, then, uh, then the points are still in R4 here. They're now supposed to be distinct along this R3, but they're also distinct along the R1. But they, they may move still, you know, homotopically. But moving, being distinct in R1 and being free to move without touching or without intersecting, that just means up to homotopy that points are equipped with an ordering, namely just their, their ordering along this R1 axis. So in total, this fiber product just says that in total we have just configurations in R3 equipped with a linear ordering. And if we combine this with our definition of differential cohomotopy here, which assigned these unordered configuration spaces, and apply that now to such a fiber product, to, su to such a combination. So take the space, which is kind of the union of these, so where, you know, as if you remove the points at infinity, these spaces are the same. And so we're adding either the points at infinity in this direction or in this direction, and we can form the union of this in the suitable sense. And then since this co-product here, this union, sent by our contravariant functor to a fiber product, we've just proven that on spaces of this form, we assign ordered configuration spaces that, go, that have this interpretation. Now we see points in these configuration spaces that may sit anywhere on an R3 here, which are ordered by the fact that they are aligned along this direction here. So you see, if you now go back to thinking about brain charges, then this is a space time here um, where charges, um, so I should wear my glasses. So this is, this is co-dimension three stuff. So this corresponds, you, you would expect the six brains sitting, where here we would expect the eight brains. So in total, this would be a space in which the charges you should measure should be intersections of six and eight brains. And on the right-hand side, we see that, um, that that's, um, the, the charges we actually see in this differential refinement of cohomotopy theory. So from, from here, we can now investigate. We say, okay, so this is, this is our co-cycle space now for, for these configurations, the cohomotopy co-cycle space. So what can we observe now? Suppose our system is in, this, is in some state here. Let's observe something. So what is observable now? So for an ordinary, for an ordinary, so this slide is overblown. Maybe just focus on the top left part here. For, for, an ordinary, for an ordinary phase space, an observable is just a function from the phase space to the real or complex numbers. It assigns to each configuration, to each state of the system, the corresponding observable. Now, since we're doing homotopy theory, cohomology theory, we should replace functions to the real numbers by, by functions to the Heinberg-Midlane spectrum. And that turns 
that turns ordinary functions into representatives of cohomology, homology classes. So for, for reasons that are, yeah, I'm starting with the homology classes just to arrange my slides. So what I'm, I'm showing here is now we're taking the homology of this co-cycle space that we've just, that we just produced. So, so this is kind of the phase space of configurations as seen by differential cohomotopy. And we're asking now, so what can we observe? What is the physical observables on this space? And by what we just said um, on the previous slide, by this little lemma here, um, it's equivalently the, the homology of the ordered configuration spaces of points. And there's a theorem which, after some digging, I, I found goes back to Fadel Husseini, Cohen, Kono and Gitla are also involved in this, but this seems to be actually the origin of this statement for the homology. So there's a curious identification of these higher observables or co-observables on cohomotopy with a um, combinatorial structure that very much starts to look like intersecting brain configurations, and we'll, we'll check a bit that it's not a coincidence. So this is traditionally called, I didn't make up this, it is traditionally called calligraphic APB for pure braid. It's an algebra that is spanned by abstract diagrams of this form, some vertical strands with some horizontal chords between them as shown here. And actually it's the linear span of all these things quotient out by two relations, which are maybe a bit hard to decipher here, but we're getting maybe to the end of this talk anyway. So there's just two relations to be quotiented out. The result is a big vector space, a graded vector space, with a vector space of horizontal chord diagrams. So it's just a fact that in some sense, these chord diagrams by this theorem encode the observe what we can observe according to this differentially refined hypothesis H. So here's just the, the, these relations again. So these chord diagrams form an algebra just by vertical composition. And the relations we're quoting, quoting are says that, that the relative vertical composition of the chords doesn't matter if they don't touch. Whereas if they do touch, if they sit on the same strand, and then this is funny looking relation, which yeah, actually, so, so another way of saying this, this is the infinitism of Bradley algebra. I guess I should come to an end. So, so one, one just looks at what these, what these equivalence relations actually mean on, symmetri on, on skew symmetrized, so on the subalgebra of skew symmetrized elements. And then it turns out they mean these things. If you skew symmetrize, it means the only configuration that are non trivial look like this. This vanishes. And if you have a guy that stretches over here, it actually breaks apart and goes back to stretch over here. So these are, if you match this to the literature, just exactly the rules of fanani witten theory for D68 brains, D6 brains stretching between NS5 and D8s, in, in the, you know, as suggested by, by this notation here. And yeah, right, this is shown in this picture. And, and one can go further now. There's lots known about these these core diagrams and the corresponding observables. And um, lots of things fall into place if one, if one regards these things now as being the observables on these corresponding brain intersections. Um, and for that, I recommend that you look at our great paper, which is the last one you find on the archive, with lots of graphics in there and full proofs and explanations. All right, thanks, yeah. Further questions for us? Please. If nobody else. Um, you already had the D68, so how do you get the fuzzy funnel then? Do you interpolate between the two spaces that you had? Or? So, so, so that was the co observer So next you want to look at, so there's this pairing. Let's see, do I have this slide here? So there was the homology, kind of the, the states or co-states are these intersecting brains. But now you also have the, the cohomology on so the linear duals of that on the space of uh, configurations, the linear, linear duals. So, so these duals, these linear duals to these core diagrams, it's called weight systems. So now there's an interesting theorem by Barnatan characterizes these weight systems. So he asks, what's the most general way of characterizing linear maps on these core diagrams, which for Arno means, what is the most general way for characterizing observables on intersecting brains? And it's rather curious how it goes because Barnatan shows that um, the most general weight systems are induced by precisely 
the ingredients we know for a chain patent data of intersecting brains. They consist of you choose a metric Lie algebra with a metric Lie representation. So if you choose, and it turns out GL2 is sufficient here. So if you choose, choose SU2, then the, the remaining choice is in the representation, which gives it the fuzzy sphere. Then you may have to choose uh, some uh, brain intersection. So you have to say, well, this what looks like a single strand here is secretly three coincident ones. And you have to choose, or you can choose to get the most general um, observable, kind of a monotony winding. So in, in producing a number actually from this brain configuration, you close up the brains and there's a permutation you can choose here. And so, so I'm using this Penrose diagram notation here. And so under this identification, so if I'm giving a chord diagram and I want to assign an observable, so the point is, which I should highlight this, you have to assign this linear, you have to send these um, brain configurations to numbers respecting these relations, the 2T and the 4T relations, which we quotiented out, which are just argued actually secretly the hanani witten relations. So you kind of have to, the observables have to reflect the, the, you know, the equivalence relations between the brain interactions. And so that's why there's constraints on here. So one way to do it is you choose a Lie representation rho of some Lie algebra, say SU2. And uh, so if you do that, then, um, then the representation you've chosen is a fuzzy sphere geometry. So if it's an irrep, it's a single fuzzy sphere. If it's a general rep, then it's some linear combination. Then it's some, some something more. Yeah, actually, what is it? So, so from the point of view of a f from the DBI model, these reps of SU2 are fuzzy funnel geometries, like this, um, by the ordering constraint, you need to have these increasing spheres. Whereas from the point of view of the BFM matrix model, which kind of describes the analogous M-theoretic configuration, these are the, yeah, I'll have a slide on this. These, these are M2, M5 brain bound states, as argued by, who's these authors? Maldacena, and so I have the references sitting be behind these links here. And then, so the point, the point I want to make here is that in, a sign, in sending your, under this Banatan theorem, sending your brain configuration to a number, you're supposed to do it like so. You label, you label these strands by your representation. So it's, it's like in, in Toft notation now. You're, and you label the, the, the vertices by your given action and the, the chords by the metric on your metric representation. So what it actually does, it, it sends every chord diagram to a multi-trace operator, as indicated here, on the corresponding gauge field theory on these brains. So this is precisely a multi-trace operator on the BMN matrix model, or at least on its supersymmetric states. And, and so here's a illustration of how it measures the fuzzy sphere. Here's a more general such multi-trace observable. And um, the point is, the point is this. Um, so you might naively think, like most authors behave as if choosing an SU2 rep is the same thing as choosing a fuzzy funnel geometry or a BMN, matrix model supersymmetric state. But of course, this can't be literally true um, because what you really have to ask is, kind of you have to divide out dualities. You have to ask what is actually observable about these states and the, the right observations, the right observables for, you know, in any holographic context is the multi-trace observable. So you should really ask what is the quotient of, this, uh, of these superpositions or mixed states of fuzzy funnel geometries as seen by actual multi-trace operators. So by what we just said, this is exactly the image under the Banatan theorem of these things in weight systems. And this has the pleasant effect that you cannot take large n limits. So, so Maldacena and three other authors argued that, we should actually, that the BMN matrix model actually describes not just M2 brains, but M2, M5 brain bound states, both represented by sequences of SU2 wraps depending on how you take the large n limits. Either you let the, sort of the number of M2 brains go to infinity or the number of, so that's how people speak. But actually in the space of, in the space of, in the naive space of states, do I have a slide for this? Oh yeah, here, in the naive space of states, say the, the, the mixtures of these representations, neither of these limits exist. As you, as you go to larger n, your representation just grows larger. It doesn't converge to anything. So to actually make it, to make a large n limit, send it to the weight system that is suitably normalized according to the multi-trace observers on fuzzy spheres. So you can do that in weight systems. You can't do it here because in weight systems, you, you know, because you can multiply, you can form weighted linear combinations of these things. And so this is a cartoon of kind of what most authors implicitly, without actually making it precise, are talking about. They say, oh, this is the space of states of, say, fuzzy funnels or, um, 
BMN matrix model states, right? It's, so it's these representations labeled by a number of M2 and M5 brains. As we send them to weight systems, due to the normalization factor that is allowed now and is actually necessary, the large N limits now actually exist. You can now move them here. So you're actually converging to an actual weight system, which then is the large N limit state. So in this sense, the space of weight systems actually contains what um, like the informal literature wants there to be as states of, the, of these models. Yeah. What role, if uh, any, does supersymmetry have right, to so play with? So that's another talk. So it turns out the way we actually arrived this at, at hypothesis H is by analyzing just the supersymmetry algebra. Do I have, can I quickly show a slide for this or I show it here? So it turns out the fact that the S4 sphere is there, I already indicated this, is something you can strictly derive just by looking at the uh, classification of higher extensions of super Minkowski space times. So there's a long story here, but it, it eventually leads to the following picture, Jon. On 11 dimensional super Minkowski space time, yeah, Hisham made a slide on this, but I think it was a, maybe a bit quick to <laughs> follow everything. So, so this carries a cost cycle sort of in, in really fight R4, which is this mu2. So this is the psi bar gamma A1, A2, psi EA1, EA2. It's the cost cycle we've seen a few times. It's represented in the category of super L infinity algebra by this map. And then you can extend by this cost cycle. So like a two cost cycle in ordinary Lie algebra classifies a Lie algebra extension. It turns out a higher cost cycle on also super Lie algebra still classifies an extension, but it's no longer just a Lie algebra, it's now a higher Lie algebra. So there's the thing we, we used to call M2 brain. This was to rhyme on the string Lie algebra, but maybe you just wanna, it's like the space time, maybe it's better to write it as a, with a hat. So it's, see if this was generated, this has a super, this is kind of the algebra dually generated by, super, by a super field bind. And then this is dually generated by the super field bind and this extra generator H3. I think you asked a question about this in a previous talk. So that extra generator is the thing that trivializes the cost cycle up here. You see such an extension as a, is the homotopy fiber of this map. So it means take this cost cycle, this space, is universal with the property that if you pull back this cosec cycle to this space, it trivializes. Well, it being universal means it has a universal generator whose D is mu2. So this is um, the way to think of this. This is the uh, 11 image super space time equipped with this three spherical vibration that is classified by this map. So this is actually where the three spherical T duality and M theory comes in that, that Hisham mentioned. But the point now is that this carries another cost cycle, mu m5. So this is the, the, mysterious, the previously mysteriously missing cost cycle in the old brain scan by Duff et al. back in the, in the 90s. They saw the m2 brain and the string and stuff. We were very excited seeing it just in super Lie algebra cohomology theory. They didn't see the, five, the m5 and the d brains. The reason we see now is because they don't exist as super cost cycles on ordinary Lie algebras, super Lie algebras, they exist on these higher extensions. So up here is a new cost cycle uh, with values in KZ4, uh, sorry, KZ7, which rash, so over R is just the same thing as S7, really fight. So there's a seven cost cycle here. And now you can ask, what is this situation jointly? So you see, we started with super space time. There was a four cost cycle. We extended, find a seven cost cycle. So there's a general homotopical descent mechanism that, ask, that tells you how to go about kind of unifying this into a single non-abelian co-cycle, before we kind of Postnikov tower here, a single non-abelian co-cycle that combines the, and, and you know, this is a mathematical thing one can check. What sits here is the four sphere, with this being kind of the rationalized C2, you know, the canonical map from the four, or you know, we might call it the Borgman homomorphism now, beta, anyway, it's the, can only map from the fourth sphere to KZ4. And this is the joint, the joint co-cycle, U2 M, M2 M5. Um, you see, the point being, from just analyzing, this is stuff that Daria and Freya really did in 82 when they wrote the article, the hidden 
like the, the math that goes into this, the, the super Lie algebra is in their article, the hidden super, 11 dimensional supergravity and its hidden supergroup. But it's, it's just looked at from, from kind of the modern homotopy theoretical perspective and th then you see what it really says is this, it really says that the M2 brain co-cycle and M5 brain co-cycle, which don't exist on the same space, so they don't actually exist in M theory, if you write them like so, right? They exist on some auxiliary space. They unify into this map to rational goal mode P. I mean, that's, that's how we actually came up with the, well, that and the fact that this gives the equations of motion, right? So what, what Daria and Freyberg then prove is that they prove that d mu M5, right, which is this, which is psi one over five bar psi bar gamma a1, a5, psi, ea1, ea5, plus h, right? It sits up here, so we can also use h3, plus h3 wedge mu m2. This is not closed. It's not actually a cos, sorry. So if you don't add, if you don't add down, sorry, down here, it's not actually a co-cycle, but d of it is, is the cup square, the square of this, two brain code cycle. So that's a big fierce identity. That's the, the, the fierce identity that controls 11 dimensional supergravity really, which they maybe observed for the first time in this, in this old article. But, but just looking at this, this, this just says that you have a representation again of the rational force, of the rational force sphere, right? This is a seven code cycle. Mu M2, mu M5 is a seven code cycle. And so this is this observation here. It comes down to, yeah, some, a simple statement. So then we looked at this, and the other thing was, we, we, when we saw this, we, we did the analogous, comp we said, well, let's, let's look at the same situation then in K, um, you know, in type two. So let's start with, not with 11 dimensional super space time, but with type two A super space time. And then you have a similar situation, you have the string co-cycle, and then on its extension sit all the D brains. And then you can do a similar, complete a similar diagram, and in that diagram, K, rational K theory, twisted K theory sits here. So it's in this sense, as I mentioned a few times before, that the fact that rational, that you know, strings are related to rational K-theory is precisely analogous to the fact that M5, M2 brains are related to cohomotopy. So at that point, it seemed clear if, you know, if the folklore about K-theory is correct, that string and D-brain charges in K-theory, then it m must be true that this is telling us something about the cohomology theory of, <clears throat> of M2, M5 brains, and that's, that's you know, that's the, and then we say, okay, then this must be true even beyond rational. So that's hypothesis H. So at the beginning, yeah, for, for a few years, we just, just did super stuff. And there, there were, yeah, there's even more to this story, right? So one can, you can actually, you can derive this down from the super point. You can start just with R01 and then play a game of iterative higher central extensions and it discovers, it, it ends in this, so in some sense, this is actually God-given. This is something that Lee theorists would have discovered eventually, even if M theorists hadn't sort of given the hints. This is just- Why does it end? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Um, we, we haven't written this up because somehow um, the collaborator was supposed to write it, he ran away. <laughs> and uh, and now, we, now we have just a note. But the th yeah, so I have to, this is another. So, so there's this process. Okay, maybe I should show the slides, but it takes me some time to dig it out. Maybe we need to do this in some break, but there's a process that it goes. You, you start with the super point, you double the fermions, take the universal uh, higher invariant thing, and double the fermions. So it's, a, it's an algorithm that discovers this, and it turns out if you, if you end up here, and you do it one more step, so now since we didn't write it up, any, so you discover the 12th dimensional super space time, you know, the funny one with, so there's some R10, comma, Two, it still has a 32 here. And then, no, the, yeah, no, wait. Yeah, right, how was it? So you see, I forget, yeah. It wasn't, yeah, right, yes. And then, um, and then some, what happens then? And then it's already, it's double, and something happens, I forget. Actually, we should have, we will forget this result if nobody wrote them. <laughs> but uh, somehow this process stops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should really, that's what I do next. Sure. Other questions? Okay. 
Okay, let's uh, let's thank Orsa again. Thank you, everyone.